Well, good afternoon. I, I can't believe that lunch is going to be served at three in the afternoon. So, you know, I'm, I'm as tired as you are. So we're just going to make it through here, okay? So the first thing, um, congratulations. Um, you were really good, okay? That's. And, and the hard part here is being Swedish because we sucked a lot. So, and, and, and you were amazing, so that, that's quite good. Although, we're Swedish, okay? Uh, so we have our upsides as well. Uh, and yes, everything you have heard is true. So you're welcome to visit wherever you want to. Uh, the interesting thing also is with being Swedish and traveling around in, in Europe, especially, and in some countries we have the Euro currency. But the first time when I decided to do the Euro coin, something went terribly wrong because they decided to take out Norway because they're not in the Union. So, I don't know what you see, I know what I see. Uh, so wherever I go now, people are like, oh, you're from Sweden, you're from the penis of Europe. Like, yes, yes, that's us. But, at least we're not Finland, okay? <laughs> see, it could be worse. So, basically my job is traveling around and uh, meeting developers and, and uh, you know, giving presentations and trying to understand what it is in different countries, what you work at, and uh, what kind of challenges you have. Um, sometimes you get a good seat, sometimes you don't. I also uh, tweet. Actually, uh, nowadays I tweet mostly useful things. It's about HTML5 and the open web, things we do at Mozilla in, in general. And, uh, you know, Coming from Mozilla, we're the good guys, okay? That's all you need to know. Uh, I'm not here to try to sell you anything. We're a non-profit. We're not making money. Uh, we're just trying to make sure that the web is as open and balanced as possible. We don't want one company to own too much of it, no matter which company it is. We wouldn't want to own all of it either, or you know, have a 100% market share or something. Uh, we build a web browser. You might have heard of it. It's called Firefox. Um, and the interesting thing there, and especially if you talk about Google Chrome, everyone asks you about Google Chrome, so I'm going to talk about it before you do. Uh, what do you think about Google Chrome? And they're getting more market share. That's amazing. I mean, that's what we wanted all the time. Look at the browser market now, going back eight or ten years, when IE had, what, 95%, 96% of the market. This is great. I, I'm really happy that Google Chrome is really good, and Safari is getting better, Opera is getting better. Internet Explorer 10 is actually pretty good. So, I mean, and that's what we want, right? We want people to have choice. And, and for me, and the people that show me examples on the computer, it's like, you know, I'm sorry for using Chrome. That's fine. You know, use whatever makes you happy, okay? I'm not here to sell you anything. I'm, I'm here to make sure that you enjoy the web. That's the important part. Uh, we also work with standards. Uh, all respect to my American friends, the system is not working. Uh, I'm not sure if the text shows, but if you look on the left side here, this is basically how you compare inches to feet to yards and ounces and all kind of made up measurements. Uh, we like standards, okay? We like standards because that's how you want to work with things. You want to figure out why it's different in a new country or a new operating system or a new browser. We want things to be the same all across the board. So. What I'll be talking about today is a number of different JavaScript APIs and, and things you can do in the web browser. So I'm going to go through a lot of them and more or less introduce you to them. And in some cases, at least I hope, make you aware of the things you probably didn't know about as well. So we'll start easy. We look at the, the file API. About 10 years too late, you can finally choose one, more than one file when you upload it in the web browser. So yay, that's progress, right? Um, but it's, it's the first step. But the nice thing, if we can upload one or more files, is also that we have the file API. And with the file API, you can get a reference to the input type file element. Uh, you have an on-change event. And as soon as you, you know, choose one or several files, you can read out data from the files directly on the client. So from each file, you can get the name and the size and the type of the file. Uh, basically, so you can make sure that you know, maybe a certain file type, XE files on Windows, et cetera, aren't allowed to be uploaded, or you can't upload more than a two megabyte attachment or something like that. 
And a couple of web browsers as well, uh, I think it's uh, Chrome and Firefox right now, uh, this also supports something called File Reader. And with File Reader, you can basically just read out the data from the file directly. So in this case, just a bunch of code, uh, but what you do, let's say the user chooses an image file in this case, and you can create an image element on the fly directly in the page. You read out the, the image that the user shows, and just read as a data URL or you know a base64 encoded string, and you can present it directly as code in the page. You don't have to upload it to the server or something similar. Then, of course, if you do want to upload it, uh, version two of the XML HTTP request supports just posting or sending complete files as well. So you set a number of headers just to make the server happy because the server has to be happy, right? Uh, and you do all that kind of things, uh, and then you send the file. So if we just look at a simple example, and if we um, combine it together with uh, drag and drop, drag and drop is a more or less quite crappy API in Israel 5, to be honest. But the nice thing is that you can interact with the operating system that the user is working in. And this is where it becomes interesting, because if you go to the desktop and you choose a couple of images here, I can drag them into the web browser and I can read out the data for all of them. So if I drop the files here, I can see here that, okay, the name of the file is Facebook and Android.png, the size is 387 kilobytes, uh, the type of the file is it's a PNG file, and it doesn't just look for the extension so you can fake it. It sh checks the actual MIME type of the file. And as you can see, with the file reader, you can also get a preview directly in the web browser, uh, which is quite nice. So then you can show the user, like, okay, these are the, the pictures you show, so this is okay, and this is what you want to upload. <clears throat> and talking about HTML5 and, and APIs, the big thing is always video. Everyone is talking about video, uh, and it's gonna, you know, fix the web or take over the web. Sorry, I'm gonna take off now. Um, and you always forget something, right? At least it was only water this time. So I'll make a statement. Um, and people get all excited about it, but, 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 no. <laughs> I'm sorry, I back? No? I can keep on doing this. Um, so the thing with Flash, and, and especially for me, I believe in open source, I believe in open standards. Flash is closed, right? But, and uh, as was mentioned before today, I think the Im important thing with Flash is rather than just dissing it or saying that it uses too much performance and it's close, et cetera, you know, all true. But rather look at the, the amazing things that some people actually created with Flash and try and learn from that. Like, you look at some of the, the animations and tweenings that you have in Flash, and, uh, well, some games you build in Flash are way superior to what you can do with Israel 5 now. So rather look at that and see how we can make an open standard better. Try and learn from it instead of just bitching about it. Because it's not a fight. If you talk to most Flash developers, they want to contribute as well. They just want to build cool games. They're not, you know, hooked on Adobe or Flash forever. They want to build nice things for their end users. If Flash is the only tool to do that right now, that's what they have to do. They have a day job. They need to get paid. They need to deliver. So be a bit gentle with them. Um, also, <laughs> when we look at video, uh, I'm going to take a stab at my friend who works for, or actually works for Microsoft, but he's also part of, of jQuery, uh, Ray Bango. And the nice thing which I like about HTML5 uh, in general is when you can combine things. So before we were combining drag and drop in the file API, and in this case, let's say you have a video, just a regular video in a page. And this is a video of Ray doing his dance. You, you don't want to have the sounds to it, trust me. Uh, it, it's, it's weird and awkward. He approved me using this. Uh, but the, the nice thing is that if you have native video directly in the web browser and you have the controls and all that, is that only through CSS uh, you can control it directly. So as opposed to a flash video or something like that, whatever you want to do, you can just do it directly, and you still have support for everything that's native in the web browser. 
So it's just an example of different technologies working together to make something better. You know, video is fine on its own, but you can do so much more. And then you can use SVG, uh, which is scalable vector graphics, and just put filters live on top of the video. It's not going to stop dancing. It keeps on going, okay? Um, so you can blur the video live. You just put a filter on top of it. Or you can in invert the colors of the video, or, you know, do it black and white, or noir, or, you know, just something that makes him slightly more sexy. Uh, but the cool thing here is that, you know, it's all being done live. You don't need to manipulate the video. You just have different layers of different effects, and you just apply them. And one of the projects that we've been working with at Mozilla is Universal Subtitles. And as you might be very well aware of, not the entire world speaks English, surprisingly enough. So the important part here is basically that you can upload a video, you can upload it to YouTube as well, but then you can add translations to that video, your own video or anyone else's video. So if there's important content up there that you want everyone to be able to take part of, and you know a couple of languages or something, you can add a translation live. You can go in and fix a translation from someone else. And as you can see as well, you can just you know, transpose the translation on top of the video. So again, you just do all of these things live. If you want to change the language in the middle, that's fine. <coughs> Sorry. We're also looking at how you can make video richer, so we're not just making the web into a, you know, a TV. Uh, and one of the products there is PopcornJS. And with Popcorn, it's basically you have a number of time markers for the video. So when you get to a certain time in the video, you show related content. So if he's flying his kite, you show a map where he is at exactly that moment in time. So it's basically just making it a bit richer. Of course, you can go overboard with this and have related content all the time. But, you know, small thing. If you have Will Pharrell dancing, uh, at the same time, you just look at the tweets for Will. See what people are saying about his dance live right now. And being Swedish, of course, it's uh, mandatory by law to talk about IKEA. So I'm sorry. I've got to. Uh, but IKEA had this nice project. Uh, where they made different music videos. So this is just a big video or big videos playing, right? But depending on how much you scroll on the page, they crossfade the sound. So you see the video coming up from the bottom? That sound gets higher and higher, and you have diff two different sounds overlapping. Just you know, small effects, but you connect it with the interaction of the user, which is pretty nice. <coughs> and also talking about uh, a number of new APIs, like what's actually out there now and what's also coming as well. Uh, with full screen, and I mean, that's one of the reasons with Flash, right? Uh, Flash uh, has been able to do full screen for a long, long time. Uh, and now we can finally do it in JavaScript. So Firefox and Chrome have support for it right now. And basically, if you trigger full screen from JavaScript, there has to be a user interaction. Uh, you can't just, you know, go into a page and throw it in full screen. The user has to click something or take action to be approved. Uh, yeah, if you zoom out, I get bigger. I'm sorry, I'm just communicating with the camera guy. Uh, and in Firefox, you go into full screen, you get some instructions here, um, uh, which basically says you need to press escape to leave the full screen mode. In Chrome, it's pretty similar. It tells you which page you're on, the URL of the page, and the keyboard shortcut you need to press to get out. And the way you do it in code, basically, let's just say you just have a button in your page. And then what you do is that you request full screen for an element. Uh, and this doesn't just have to be the entire page. It could be just a button in a page or a video in the page or whatever you can think of. Um, in this case, you know, different code for Firefox and, and Chrome. And you request full screen for that element, and it then it that specific element goes into full screen. In this case, it's a document element, so it is the entire page, as you just saw in the screenshots. But it could be only for videos or something else as well. And when you go into full screen, we always have the risk of, of phishing or you know, people having evil websites out there where they capture your key input, they get your credit card numbers and things like that. Um, probably to pay for the bill for conferences like this. Um, 
And the way you do that, in, in Google Chrome, is basically if you request full screen for an element, you just send in a flag. And you say, yes, capture all keyboard input as well. Um, at Mozilla, we're not really sure that's the optimal solution. I, th I think w there's a bigger risk there. If you just go into full screen, you get keyboard support, there's going to be bad websites out there uh, making bad things with it. Not you, other people. Um, so we're suggesting having another method, uh, something like must request full screen with keys. And then, of course, to make the user aware of you going into full screen mode now and every keyboard input is going to be tracked, just so you know. And of course, it's very difficult to find a decent level with that. Because as you know, I mean, for, for us, for developers, you know, we, we see something, you know, the, the browser tells you something, and so, OK, fine, I'll accept this, et cetera. But most users are like, there's a dialogue on my screen, and then they shoot themselves, right? So how do we find a decent level of notify them? And, and I don't know yet. There, there are discussions going on how to make it easier, but it, it is important. And the nice thing as well, when you go into full screen, is that you have pseudo classes in CSS to hook into that. So basically for um, Firefox and Chrome here, <coughs> sorry, uh, is that for the element that you requested full screen for, the full screen pseudo class gets triggered. So what you can do in this case, I just make the background red, but you can do something else. Like you can say that if you go into full screen, maybe you want to show the button that is, you know, close full screen or back to normal or something like that. So it's just small things. You don't need to track events in JavaScript to know that it happened. The CSS is actually working together with the JavaScript here. And then finally, uh, we're getting access to the camera as well. And right now, and I keep on repeating this, Firefox and Chrome, Firefox and Chrome. Um, on Android right now, in Firefox and in Chrome, uh, there is support for accessing the camera directly. So if you have an input type file element uh, in a page, um, the, the user taps it, and then you get the, the choice, right? And then we utilize intents in Android. So you have the regular listing of choosing files, like from the gallery or from file expert or something like that. But you also get the camera as an option. So if you choose the camera, it goes directly into the camera app. You can take a picture of your nice shoes or something that's important for the world. Uh, and then you just approve that picture, and that gets uploaded into the web browser directly. And it's really easy to do. If you look at the code, you have input type file. You have an attribute you might not have used that much, which is the accept attribute. So in this case, you just specify that for this input type file, accept any kind of image file, like image slash uh, wildcard, basically. And you have, as we saw before, with the file API and on change event, in this case, you just get a reference to the first file, which is basically the picture that the user took of him or herself. Uh, and then you can use something which is pretty cool, uh, which is basically uh, the um, blob URLs or, or object URLs, as they're known. Uh, just different ways of doing it in Firefox and Chrome right now. Uh, but the way it is, like you might have been using base 64 strings before for describing images or similar. In this case, you get something that's more like a GUID. Uh, so you get a number of characters that are magical to the web browser which actually describes that image directly. So the web browser knows only by this short string, this long, okay? By this short string that, okay, this is the image that you actually uploaded. And then you can set that image to a source uh, of an element in the page directly. So again, this is as we saw with the file API, you can just take a picture of yourself with the camera on Android and then see the result directly in the web browser, which is pretty cool. And then, on the horizon, the future, uh, is the magic WebRTC, which is going to save everyone. Uh, and the thing with WebRTC is basically web real-time communication. So if we can take pictures of ourselves right now on the phone, and in the future on the desktop as well, uh, this is just making it richer. How can we have a live stream of video and of sound directly in the web browser? Basically, building Skype or something similar. Uh, Code-wise, uh, and this is the way it's supposed to work, uh, right now I think Chrome, if you use a, a flag and s start one of the dev releases, 
you can test it out right now. We have a special build of Firefox where it works. Opera is also doing some pretty good work here. It's uh, Opera Next, I think it's called, the alpha release they have. Um, so good things. Uh, and the only way you do it is basically on the navigator object in the web browser, you have a get user media method. And it accepts three different parameters. So the first parameter is the interesting one. And with that parameter, you specify, OK, what kind of information, what kind of media do I want to get from the user? So in this case, you have a JavaScript object. You say video true, and then you get access to the video. But then you can keep on adding things like audio and any other kind of input in the future. The second parameter is basically a success handler. Like if you get access, in this case, to the video from the webcam, uh, you do something. And you get a stream object. So if you have a video element in the page, let's say it's called live video, you just set the source of that video element to the stream. And then in the web browser, you see yourself being streamed through your webcam. The future, right? Uh, and the third parameter is basically just an error handler if, if it fails. Yeah. Uh, and then if you're building games, we have the, the pointer lock API. And going through my slides, I, I you know, see this uh, picture. And I always hated when people have pictures of cats in their presentations because it's so it's such a giveaway, right? It's so boring. Uh, however, I, I think I can be excused because this cat is going to die. So it's okay, right? It should be a, a proper exception. So the idea with pointer lock is basically like if you build the game on the web right now, uh, you move the mouse to the right of the web browser window, it stops because it's like the, the edge of the world. The ed edge of the web browser, that's where it ends. You go to the left, you hit the stop, you can't get further. So with um, pointer lock, you basically take over control from the web browser uh, with handling the, the mouse movements. So the first thing you do is that you request pointer lock, uh, which is going to be just by default approved by the web browser right now. And when you do that, uh, you get the delta movements. So basically, you get the x movement, and you get the y movement within the page. And what this means in practice is that people can just keep on going to the right with a mouse, and it doesn't stop. It doesn't hit like, no, oh no, you went to the border of the web browser window. You can just keep on going. And uh, let's see if it shows well enough on the plasma. But if you're building a game where you're walking around in a, um, a building here, and you know, in this case, it stops. You come to the end of the wall, and you can't go further. You go the other way, and then it stops. So in this example, they've been building, like, if you go into full screen, they request pointer lock. So one thing you might not see it, is that the, the pointer disappears. You don't see the pointer in the page. It's actually like a real game, which is pretty cool. And you can just keep on spinning, because it's up to you as a developer to control the, the window reactions to your mouse movements. Um, and all of this is quite nice, because now, you know, full screen, pointer lock, etc., you can start building much more richer things on the web. Uh, I'm just going to briefly mention web storage and the, more like a lead up to what I'm talking about next. And I'll use a guy you know for it. <clears throat> it's always a, a general fear if you come from anywhere west of Russia, like how far can I go? Uh, so we'll see. Uh, so basically, the, the idea with storage uh, is that through key value pairs, you can store things directly in the web browser. Uh, in general, you have up to five megabytes of storage, right? Uh, so you have two different ways of doing it. Uh, so in key value pairs, you set a key that Putin wrestles, uh, and he wrestles bears, right? And you want to save that value. With session storage, it's only for that session. As soon as you close the tab or the browser or something like that, the session is gone, and you need to start over. Uh, let's say you use local storage, that his occupation is politician. Uh, with local storage, it's just going to persist. You can close the web browser, you can keep on doing things. Depending on the web browser, it's actually quite tricky to find what's being stored in local storage. And it, it doesn't get removed if you clear your cache. So it's, it's good to be aware of. Uh, I don't know what kind of websites you visit, but anyway. Um, 
so the thing with you know local storage and session storage is quite nice, right? The problem with it, though, that hasn't really been touched on, is that it's not asynchronous. So it's a, a, just a, a file operation, a, you know, a file I/O, uh, which is the buzzword with Node and all that. Uh, I/O is bad, evil, etc., and it can be amazing if it's asynchronous. And the thing here with uh, local and session storage is basically that if you have a big write operation, or if you're just unlucky in general, you can freeze the entire web browser. Uh, so you don't have a callback when, when you're going to write this data, the browser could freeze, or it could take five seconds or something like that. So it's not a big risk, but it's very important to know that you know if you build your entire business on local storage, there's a risk in there. And if you want to store more advanced data, of course, because we need to save every data we can about Mr. Putin, uh, it's basically, you know, Jason Object, he sings, yes, and he sang the song Blueberry Hill. I haven't seen the video yet, but I will. Um, but what's good to know here, and all respect to different libraries and wrappers to making local storage easy, but it's quite easy to do it without it as well. Like, you have native JSON objects and web browsers, right? So you can just take this JSON object and use the stringify method. So all of this data gets turned into a string because local storage only accepts strings. Store it as a long, long string there, and then when you read it out again, you use the parse method, and then you get the same value back as a JavaScript object to work with. So which sort of leads on to talking about index DB. Uh, it's good to know that if you go to Disneyland, you can buy a body part storage box. I don't know what kind of weird ass Disneyland that is, but um, so the thing with IndexedDB, and of course the power here is that it's a much more performant database, and it's also asynchronous. Uh, and just touching on, and it was mentioned before somewhere over there about WebSQL. Basically, the backstory about WebSQL is that. Uh, WebKit in Safari and in Google Chrome and Opera um, thought it was a good idea and implemented it. Uh, Microsoft and Mozilla said, no, we don't think this is the right way to have advanced storage on the web. Uh, and, you know, we discussed back and forth and, you know, what kind of dialect of SQL light should be in web SQL, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and then eventually, you know, it's, it's years of discussion, of course. Uh, it, we all came to the conclusion that we're probably not going to go along with it. If you build something specific for WebKit, sure, you can use it. Uh, but uh, otherwise, IndexedDB is going to be implemented, or is actually almost implemented by everyone right now. Uh, not fully, but partial support. And this is going to be the boring part of the slide, so I'll, I'll work through it fast. The, the first thing is basically just a bunch of prefixes, okay? And I don't have enough time to talk about prefixes. Basically, prefixes is a pain in the ass for a developer, uh, and I understand that. From a web browser vendor perspective, that's the only way we can experiment with implementations, and if we mess the implementation up, or if we change the implementation, it's not the official one without prefix. So this is our way to test things before they actually go live. So it's chicken and egg problem, I guess. So basically, with IndexedDB, um, you open a database. You use the open method. So in this case, you open elephant files, and you just send in a version number. The important part here is if the version number is higher than the existing number of the database, or if the database doesn't exist, we have an event being triggered on the bottom here called uh, on upgrade needed. And when on upgrade needed gets called, you can create an object store. And of course, you create an object store to store objects. So we create an object store named elephants. <coughs> and then we make an XHR request to our server uh, just to get an image to store in our IndexedDB database. The interesting thing part, or interesting part here, is basically you do the XHR, you get the image name elephant.png, but the next line in the code, when you choose the response type, you choose blob. So talking about blob and, and object URLs before, you can now, um, for a couple of browsers, actually it's only Firefox has full support right now and Chrome's gonna do it. Um, you can get a blob back directly from the server. Uh, and then when you do that, you get a status 200, you can put that blob into your database. And the way you do it is through transactions. So you do a transaction uh, into the elephant's object store and you do a read-write transaction. 
basically I'm going to write something into the database right now. Um, and when you initialize that, uh, you get a reference to object store, elephants, and then you use the put method. So you put the blob into the database with the key image. So it's kind of turned around. So you put the value first and the key after that one. I don't know why. Uh, and then the same as we saw before, you can read out that image through the get method again, use object URLs or whatever you want to, and present that image directly in the file read from IndexedDB. It's a lot of code, and I'm, I'm going to share the slides later as well. We're also getting access to the battery now. Uh, this is not only mobile phones, it's also on desktop. Uh, we have pretty good support in Windows and in Linux, not properly yet on Mac OS X. And generally, you can read out the level, the status of the battery, and how long time it's going to take until it's fully charged. Uh, so basically, uh, just have a MOS battery object in our implementation. You get out the value, and I think the charging one is kind of interesting because then you know if, if you're going to be in a, a you know powerful transaction, you can see if the if it's plugged in or not, if it's a phone or a laptop, right? And you know why would you use that? And the, the idea here is basically if you're going to start a very heavy file syncing operation or something like that, you can notify the user. You only have 5% battery left. If you start this operation, things can go pretty bad. And then you have a number of events, basically, if the battery level changes, if the charging changes, basically, if you plug it in or unplug it, and then if the charging time changes. And one thing I want to mention is that with, in Mozilla, we're working on a mobile operating system called, right now, uh, Boot to Gecko. And the idea with Boot to Gecko is basically to have just a low level access to the phone uh, through a Linux kernel. And then we put Gecko on top of that. Gecko is the rendering engine of Firefox. So basically, everything on this phone that you can interact with and that you build things with is HTML5, CSS, and JavaScript uh, directly on the phone. I also have a phone with me. So please, you know, corner me somewhere, and I'll, I'll show you. And you know, as a developer, you change things on the phone all the time, so it's pretty broken. But I can show you the things that work today, maybe. Uh, and the idea, of course, is that we can do all these things on a phone right now. Uh, and we wanted to make it as easy as developers as possible. So one thing, of course, being Mozilla, is that it's open. Uh, so it's just open standards. You don't need to learn Objective-C or Java or something else. Uh, it's just the web code that you code all the time for websites. And you get all the interfaces through this code. Uh, and the nice thing also with being Mozilla and, and GitHub is great, is that from day one, uh, boot to Gecko has been available on GitHub. You can go in there, you can get the code, you can you know, submit things, test things. We also have, as you saw in the slides before, our own user interface for boot to Gecko called Gaia, which is basically the HTML, CSS, and JavaScript part. But we're also partnering with the Telefonica operator and uh, Telefonica is building their own user interface. So it's basically like boot to Gecko is just making it available on a phone, and you can put any kind of user interface on top of it. Like on my phone, I just code some things in HTML code and send it to the phone and change it. And if you want to read more about that, uh, with MDN, or the Missile Developer Network, which is a wiki, so you can go in and change and update things as well, there's a lot of information on with the project, if you want to run the emulator if you want to, and hacking Gaia, the user interface itself. So right now, you can run it on a couple of phones that run Android, like the uh, Galaxy S2 from Samsung, and the Nexus S, and the Galaxy Nexus. And a few APIs that we get with that. One is, of course, accessing the telephone. Uh, it was just the first picture that came up when I was looking for funny pictures with phones. I can't help it. So in this case, you have a MOS telephony object. Uh, so it's really easy to work with. So when you have access to the telephone, you can check a few properties, like is it muted? Is the speaker enabled or not? Want to call a friend? Fantastic. Use the dial method, provide a number. And it's not supposed to be harder than that. You don't want to have five lines of code just to trigger something and namespaces and all of that. This is what you do. I want to call. Fine. And then, yeah, of course, you have events. You have the incoming event. Like, if someone is calling you right now, you get the incoming call. 
you have an event object. And when you have a reference to the call itself, you have a property, for instance, to check the number. So who's calling me right now? And of course, you want to hook it up with a service to see if there's someone you actually want to talk to or not. Um, and then, of course, if you want to answer the phone, you use the answer method. Quite complicated, right? Uh, and of course, if you hang up, you use the hang up method. And th that's the whole idea, to, to make it as easy as possible. And the same thing with sending text messages. You have a mass SMS object. If you want to send the text message, you choose the number and then the message, and you send it. If you receive a text, same thing, you've got an event object, you read out the message. Uh, I'll actually ask, can I go for 10 more minutes or something? Yeah, yeah. Good. See so enough sign waving there. Uh, which movie? Good. How did they do it? So they had a glass. It wasn't dinosaurs, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah? I don't know. Uh, so th the way they did it is that they had this glass, right? And they had a piano wire on top of it. And then they kept on playing on, playing on it. It's like boing, boing, boing. And then they get the vibrations and then the, the water vibrates, right? Pretty cool. So how do you make the phone vibrate? How do you make the dinosaur phone? System? Something like that. Uh, it's basically just a lot of uh, event listeners here, but you got the most vibrate method. Um, and with most vibrate, you basically just provide milliseconds. So in the first case, you want the phone to vibrate for one second. Fantastic. The second example is a bit more interesting because then you get intervals. So you provide an array. So the first number here is basically it's going to vibrate for 200 milliseconds. Then it's going to be silent for 100 milliseconds. Then it's going to vibrate for 200, etc. So you can basically write your own vibration songs if you want to. Uh, please don't. Uh, I know you will, but don't. Uh, then, of course, you can try and make it vibrate as long as possible to break your phone, because it's fun to break stuff. Uh, it only worked with five seconds or something for me, so I'm, I'm a bit disappointed. Um, and if you want to turn it off, you just provide zero, like stop vibrating right now. Um, all of these APIs that I've been talking to, at least from a Mozilla perspective, that all we do, we want it to be standardized. Uh, and we're working together with a device API working group and you know, all kinds of different groups with W3C to make sure that it becomes a standard and to make everyone implement it. Because if we were building things, you know, no matter how good they are, just for ourselves, that's kind of a waste, isn't it? If it's not the same for everyone, why would you do it, honestly? Because it's just going to be a mess for developers, it's going to be a mess for users. Um, and if you want to test different things, uh, it basically we have different releases of Firefox. And we have someone call, uh, something called Aurora. And basically, Aurora is the last release before things get stabilized. So if you want to play around with new APIs and you know see if they're broken or come up with a better idea or just test things, you can test Aurora. And, and it's basically also not just you know, help us fix our crap, but it's also a way for you to be part of building the future APIs on the web. So the, the point of this talk, and, and I'm not going against what Phil said before, but I'm, I'm a bit more crazy than Phil is, uh, try new shit. Uh, you know, try things, play around with it, and then see what happens. Like the, the Berlin uh, Symphony Orchestra, they decided to put macro cameras inside the instruments. So this picture is basically taken from inside a violin, right? And it's pretty cool. It's like a, a new world. So it's just more about, you know, take the small shitty JavaScript, JavaScript code we have and try a different angle. Try and play with it. Try and break it. Try and see what happens. Uh, and, you know, you can always experiment. You can always be the guy that brings your gun to band practice because, you know, gunshots is always fun. Uh, and that's okay. Just, you know, try something. And, you know, Russians, you're amazing. I've, I've been waiting for this. Uh, I might not live long enough for it, but thank you. Make this happen. It's like the movie Iron Sky, if you've seen it, but it wasn't Russian, so. Uh, I'll let you read it if you haven't seen it before. So basically, the point is, uh, whatever you find, share it on the web. Write a blog post. Share it on GitHub.
because we don't want this to happen. We don't want it to be like, you know, whatever you find out. Like in this case, as long as you Google for something, you have this example, like someone had the same problem, but you don't know how to solve it. And it's, sometimes it's even worse. Like this guy, Denver Code 9, replies to his own post saying something like, don't worry, I solved it, and nothing more. Right? Because then you want to find out where he lives. So if you find a solution, share it. Because we, we all try different things, and we think differently. And it's also about being nice on the web. Uh, you can always put people down, and you can write nasty tweets. And, and people might be wrong, or people might be bad. But if you're constructive, and if you actually try and, and help people, just see the progress you're going to make. So take care of each other, OK? And also, on the web, there's room for everyone. It doesn't matter what you look like or how big or small you are. Um, so for me, <laughs> HTML5 is the beauty of the open web. It is amazing, the things we can build together. And actually, everyone can contribute. It's not closed. It's not owned by anyone. It's for, for the entire world. So I'll end this with a quote from one of my favorite TV shows, Lost. Um, so we saved the world together for a while, and that was lovely. And that's how I want to spend my life. I, I could do many different things, but if I can do something, if I can act slightly as a better person, if I can try and build something that helps people and have people help me and do things together, you know, that seems at least like it's remotely useful this, the short time I live. And that's how I like to see the things we do with Mozilla as well. We're not making any money off of it. We're making enough money to you know, pay for plane tickets and travel around and teach people. And that's about it. So we're just trying to make the web and, you know, as an enhancement of that, the world a better place. And I hope you'd like to be a small part of that as well. So thank you for having me. Let's have lunch. Ребят, uh, пойдемте кушать. Hello guys, let's go to eat because everything's ready. Robert, thank you very much once again. And uh, one more small statement. Those of you who participated in Super Job uh, Prize Draft iPads will be played at 4 p.m. even. So you will have to eat and check your luck. Bon appetit.